Welcome everybody to the British Chamber of Commerce Waste to Value in ASEAN webinar. I'd like to uh, welcome you all and uh, thank the moderator Alard Nui from the Energy and Utilities Business Group, as well as our speakers. One of the things we like to do in BritCham is make sure that we connect across the ecosystem. And I'm very pleased that we have Semcorp, Circulate Capital, KPMG and Standard Chartered Bank. And of course, a big thank you to all of the Chamber's sponsors for allowing us to continue to do these events in our virtual format. This event is part of the uh, Chamber's Road to Net Zero, which is a campaign that we're running in the lead up to COP26. And this event is put on by the Energy and Utilities Business Group in coordination with the Sustainability and the Built Environment Group. So with that, we're going to cover an awful lot of ground. We're going to cover regulation, we're going to cover economics, we're going to cover finance, we're going to talk about some of the technical issues as well. I'm going to hand over to Allard, who's going to introduce the panellists and moderate the event, and then I'll be back towards the end. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Tim, and good afternoon, everyone. And welcome to the Waste of Value in ASEAN webinar organized by the Energy and Utilities Group of Bridgeham, Singapore. Uh, I'm extremely delighted that we have uh, a, a very uh, well-distinguished panel, um, all coming from different areas and will be addressing different aspects of the Waste of Value chain in, in ASEAN. Um, the speakers will introduce themselves in a few minutes and uh, some of the speakers do have uh, a couple of slides to support that introduction. Sabina, if you could turn to my first slide. Next slide, please. Next slide. Um, my name is Olaf Noy. I'm the CEO of Infraco Asia and we're headquartered here in Singapore. We're focused on 12 countries in South and Southeast Asia and we basically provide both leadership and funding bridging the infrastructure gap in South and Southeast Asia. And we do this through very early stage project development and investments uh, and we basically are a catalyst for further private sector capital to invest with us in sustainable infrastructure projects in South and Southeast Asia. We are part of the Private Infrastructure Development Group, PIBG in short, headquartered in London, uh, founded back in 2002. And uh, Infraco Asia is one of the six subsidiary companies under the PIBG and became operational in 2010. Um, we are now very proud to say that we're an award-winning company. Uh, we won the PFI Thomson Reuters Award in 2017 the Smart Seed Investor uh, Award and uh, the Bridgem 2017 Excellence in Sustainable um, uh, Award, as well as the IGA Global Award in 2018. Next slide, please. Municipal solid waste uh, generation rates uh, vary widely within and between countries, but it is positively correlated with income levels. So the higher the uh, GDP per capita is, the higher the volume of waste is, but there is even a direct correlation between the calorific value of waste and GDP uh, per capita. Um, in ASEAN specifically, um, we are experiencing an increased trend in population growth and urbanization rate. And I, uh, the ASEAN countries have now a combined population of approximately 650 million people, which accounts for 8.3% of the world population. More than half of its total population is now living in urban areas, creating more pressure on sustainable waste management. Next slide, please. Uh, according to the estimates by the Brookings Institution, uh, the global middle class uh, exceeded 3 billion people by the end of 2015 and continues to grow. Each year, uh, 150 million people are added with an overwhelming majority of new entrants, of which 88% are living in, in Asia. Next slide, please. With increasing industrial developments, urbanization and growing middle class, many of the developing nations are facing a dual energy and a waste challenge and growing energy demand and municipal waste generation are going hand in hand. 
environmental concerns are resulting in increased legislative pressure for additional waste disposal facilities and the application of new te technologies. And then lastly, uh, project funding needs are growing, but the governments are under pressure to restrain public funding. And therefore, there is an opportunity for private sector involvement in the waste management sector. Next slide, please. The waste management hierarchy is uh, basically covering the four R's. Um, basically, the reduction of waste is at source. Uh, so it basically uh, focuses on the uh, unnecessary consumption of resources using less material in manufacturing. If you're looking at reuse and recycling, uh, these are directly extracts from waste and uh, and avoid the need for additional waste treatment and or disposal infrastructure. Uh, for instance, um, repairing uh, items or parts. And if you're looking at recovery, recovery of organic materials, generation of renewable and or non-renewable energy, which diverts waste from the disposal sites. For instance, energy recovering from anaerobic digestion, thermal treatment, as well as uh, landfill gas. And then the last resort is basically non-recoverable and inert material for disposal in sanitary landfills. Next slide. Those are my introductory remarks. I'm now pleased to hand over uh, to, uh, to Daniel, uh, Daniel Wong, who represents uh, SEMCORP. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, please allow me in the next few minutes to introduce my uh, SAMCOP and myself. SAMCOP is a leading energy and urban development company driven by our passion and purpose to do good and develop a sustainable future. We invest, build, own and operate power assets globally to deliver innovative energy, energy solutions to support the energy transition and sustainable development. Currently, we own and operate about 12,600 megawatt of thermal and renewable assets around the world, mostly in Southeast Asia, India and China, UK, with more than 2,600 megawatts capacity in solar and wind energy. Besides energy, SAMCOP also operates in the environmental space, particularly in the industrial wastewater and solid waste management. We manage around 8.6 million cubic meters of wastewater a day, mostly in Singapore and China, with a strong focus on the treatment and recycling of industrial wastewater from heavy industry, such as petrochemical and the chemical industry. We also provide integrated waste management and recycling solution across the entire value chain of waste collection, cleaning, treatment, and recovery of resources, such as MRF plants and waste to energy facilities. We manage a wide variety of waste streams that includes municipal solid waste, commercial and industrial waste, construction and demolition waste, toxic industrial waste from different sectors. Today, our waste business primarily operates in Singapore and the United Kingdom. Okay, a bit about me. I work for the, I work in the waste to resource space for the SAMCOP group under the Office of the Renewables and Environment Business Line. I have primarily two uh, areas of responsibility. First, rather normal one is to assist the operating plants to address strategic recurring technical issues, improve their performance of our assets. And, and that includes troubleshooting technical problems and developing solutions and, and changing the business model, how we uh, provide waste management services. My second responsibility, uh, which is a far more interesting one, is essentially understanding the trends of the waste industry market and position the market, uh, company ahead to develop innovative uh, solutions and business model. Um, we look at things like uh, adoption of new technologies and creation of new business model that could disrupt the traditional way of uh, waste management. Sectors which I dwell in would be things like camp cycling of plastic, waste recycling, um, waste to chemicals, sustainable aviation fuel, decentralized treatment of waste, so on and so forth. Um, this is my fifth year in uh, SAMCOP. 
Prior to that, I used to work in, I, I work for various waste management companies, including 14 years in China. Over to you, Alok. Thank you very much, uh, Daniel, uh, for uh, that um, uh, short and sharp introduction. Um, next in, uh, in line is Regula. Uh, Regula uh, Shek, who represents uh, the, so Asia, uh, is MD for Asia in Circulate Capital. Regula, over to you. Thank you, Allard. Uh, good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, my name is Regula Shek. I'm the Managing Director for Asia, overseeing our Ocean Funds investments in South and Southeast Asia. Um, the Ocean Funds, uh, represented by Circular Capital, is the first global fund which really focuses solely on building infrastructure, investing in companies and innovation, which prevents further plastic leaking into the ocean and bring it back into the circular economy, economy for recycling and really um, valorize the plastic we're using today and throwing away. Next slide, please. Uh, as an investment management firm, when we started looking at the issue of how can we actually um, direct capital into the market to build the solid waste management infrastructure needed, particularly in South and Southeast Asia, where the biggest part of the leakage is happening, um, we realized that we, 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 issue, we, we uh, faced an issue between the disconnect between the capital, which is available in the market, and the operators. So when you look at the, the capital available in investing in the infrastructure of solid waste management, there is some capital of around 20 million available often in the early stage development of startups. Um, but there is no institutional capital available to really build these businesses to growth and expansion stage where then institutional investors can come in and invest. And so that is really the gap where we see and where we see ourselves to, to play a critical and catalytic role to, to enable the development of these companies to then attract more capital into the market. Um, the infrastructure, solid waste management infrastructure in Southeast Asia um, is clearly undersourced. Um, the conventional investment or financial industry often has not fully understood what it takes to invest in these companies. They're often um, family owned, first, second, third generation. Um, and, and we as an investor come in to really not only provide capital to have them grow, but also provide technical assistance, support they need, whether it's in finance operation and link them up with the partners out there, um, which are the, in, the uh, companies, the multinationals who are or have an interest in the offtake of the material. Next slide. Next slide, please. Wonderful. So the Ocean Fund was launched late last year. Um, the founding investors are some of the largest multinational corporations uh, in the fast moving consumer good companies, as well as chemical companies. Uh, we raised so far $106 million for investment. However, this is really just an initial start looking at the billions which are needed to really um, build ecosystems and solid waste management infrastructure needed to tackle the ocean plastic leakage. Um, we are in a blended finance mechanism, meaning that while our investors, our corporates invested funds, we also have a guarantee by the US International Development, Development Finance Corporation to de-risk some of our portfolio, which allows us to, to really be very flexible in how and where we invest we mainly invest in South and Southeast Asia, in India and Indonesia, which are two of the biggest contributors to ocean plastic leakage uh, fo uh, following China, and then Thailand, Vietnam, and, in, um, and uh, the Philippines, which are the other three countries where the biggest leakage is happening. Next slide. Just to give you an idea of what that means in reality, um, we invest in uh, often uh, local companies um, as I mentioned, they may have been around just a couple of years or a, a couple of ge uh, generations who really have been building a solid business, have been uh, uh, really generating revenues, but now want to step up to international needs and, 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 and uh, requirements 
to really go beyond and provide the quality and quantity of material needed in the markets. Lucro is an interesting uh, investment we've made uh, in India, which is really focusing on the flexible packaging, which is one of the most difficult material to recycle. And flexible packaging is also often what actually is leaking. So when we think about all the material, the 150 million um, tons in the ocean and the continuous leaking of the plastics, a lot of it is not per se the PET bottle we're, we're, we're using, but a lot of it is uh, um, low density material, sachets, um, plastic bags, which are leaking. And this company is really investing in, in, in recycling that flexible material. The other investment is, uh, is Tree Oasis. It's a Jakarta-based company run by two females who've started about three years ago, left their corporate jobs with the intent to really valorize the material and bring it back. And they're recycling our P as PET bottles into flakes, which then can be used in textile and packaging. So these are just two examples to address how we invest in what kind of companies we invest to really try to holistically tackle the setup and the build up of a, a solid waste management infrastructure. And I can go more into details later. Back to you, Alers. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Regula. And uh, yeah, some two great, great uh, case studies indeed. Um, the next one, providing an introduction about uh, himself and the company which he represents is Paul Kent of KPMG. Thanks, Claudia Allard. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Paul Kent. Um, I'm based here in Singapore. Uh, Singapore uh, is a regional hub in the Asian region. Uh, KPMG, we're a global business, so uh, we have pretty strong countries globally. Uh, Alad, can you hear me? I just get my connection is quite unstable. <clears throat> I can hear you. Okay. Hey, great. Uh, here in, in Singapore, uh, we have quite a strong uh, and we do operate quite extensively in the uh, waste to energy life cycle and probably more broadly across the infrastructure life cycle. We have people here um, in the advisory group that um, are in sustainability and they look at some of the elements of the, the policy and recycling and so forth but also um, on the financial advisory side, we're, we're quite strong and we have a, a across the region. We work across the, um, the entire um, life cycle from everything at the concept plan, the pre-feasibility stages of the project through to um, the project financial close, execution, yet divestment of the asset as well. Myself personally, um, I'm an economist by uh, training and background, so I tend to operate at the very front end of projects. Usually that's involving in, in the sense of regulatory considerations that accompany some type of large scale project development. In ASEAN, uh, just to touch on a few bits and pieces which uh, Alad um, captured quite well, but one of the things so it's not really a surprise is that working in ASEAN, there is a, such a massive diversity of the political, social, economic uh, structures that exist um, by country. And being considerate of that is in, in terms of um, making a project a success. Uh, the Asian population is growing uh, rapidly and uh, currently it will be around the fourth largest, um, around 650 million people and that's driving um, tremendous strains, pressures in terms of waste but also in other areas, social development uh, and so forth. Uh, GDP, it's, it's a very strong region growing very fast and to touch a little bit on what Allard was saying before is that there is a strong correlation between um, waste generation or the types of waste that are generated on a per capita basis and the income levels that exist. So if we looked at the um, by region, uh, we'd sort of see that some of the countries on a population, total population level, some of the largest contributors to waste, such as Indonesia, Thailand, uh, Vietnam, Philippines, and so forth, down to the smaller ASEAN countries. But when we look at that on a per capita basis, the relationship changes quite considerably. And we'll see the smaller countries and the, the higher income countries, such as Singapore, Brunei, Malaysia, at the top of that, uh, that level. 
I think just the last things to really um, wrap up on, on, on my introduction is that some of the areas that we always look at when we're, we're working on either a large project or companies, the project is the economic, environmental and social aspects of that and, and quantifying those into the overall um, decision-making process for evidence-based policy making. Um, we look at some of the factors that might be um, applicable in that. So the, you know, the, the ability of waste collection, can that actually occur? The role of the informal sector, the abilities to pay, and that comes back to the diversity we see across ASEAN. And then moving into some of the technology, again, the, um, the availability of land, which has a big implication about some of the treatment options which are available. The affordability, always very important, and the um, capacity of governments to, to supplement or support some of the funding that is required. And finally, that flows through to pricing. Um, we put in together externalities and others which are associated with that is a really a good thing to be doing. Just um, pass back to you. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, and last but not least, uh, Sujay Shah, who is uh, the Managing Director and Global Head for Clean Tech Coverage at Standard Chartered Bank. Sujay, over to you. Morning, Alad, and morning, everyone. Uh, as Alad said, I uh, lead the Clean Tech Sector Coverage for Standard Chartered Bank globally. For all of those uh, who may not know uh, Standard Chartered Bank, we are a fairly strange animal. We are actually listed out of London, but do most of our business in Asia. In fact, in a number of these markets, uh, we've been there for uh, more than 100 to 150 years. So we know ASEAN quite well. Uh, within the bank, uh, I'm quite fortunate enough uh, for a living to essentially work in a role where we have a dedicated team covering sectors like renewable energy, waste, batteries, etc. So the sectors which are focused on the environment, where we work with clients across the bank for things like M&A, bonds, financing for projects within these sectors. Um, uh, Sabina, if I could just ask you to uh, flip to the next page, please. Yeah, so as you can see, uh, uh, most of the business initially for me was largely renewable energy. We worked on over 50 transactions in the last few years. But uh, as you move to the next slide, what you will see is that our business is increasingly moving towards the waste side. And we've been involved in a number of transactions on the waste side, and those transactions are getting more diverse in the type of activities and also much larger compared to what they were just a few years ago. To give you a few examples of uh, transactions that we worked on uh, earlier this year, uh, we helped uh, sell Korea's largest environmental services company called EMC, which does waste to energy, uh, water waste, uh, as well as waste oil management. Uh, for almost a billion dollars, one of the largest deals uh, in the waste sector globally. And we saw a range of um, investor interests, right from strategic investors, uh, financial investors, and to uh, sort of Regula's point, right? When you build up a quality scale business, the investors will come. So uh, what we are doing is trying to bridge that gap between uh, the larger investors and essentially the platforms which have reached that scale. A uh, couple of other examples of deals we worked on, what you'll see uh, is a second deal uh, uh, on the top, which is a um, uh, uh, waste to energy plant we financed in Vietnam. It's a $200 million uh, financing we did um, uh, for financing one of Vietnam's largest waste to energy uh, plants that is coming up for a Chinese client. And again, sort of goes back to uh, the point which uh, uh, Allard and Paul were making right at the beginning, that waste is increasingly becoming an important issue within Southeast Asia. And we'll have to think of various ways and uh, in ways to mitigate uh, um, the impact coming from this. And lastly, uh, we've also recently financed uh, one of China's largest privately owned waste to energy companies where we provided them uh, debt capital at the whole co to help finance more waste to energy plants that are coming up in the rest of China. So it just gives you a flavor of different markets, different types of deals that we're doing across the whole waste sector. Ala? Thank you very much, uh, Sujay, um, for, uh, for that very um, good introduction. Um, let me um, turn, to, turn to the panel. Um, and first, we would like to address uh, open dumps. Uh, open dumps or, or landfills are uh, still uh, sort of, the, in, in certain countries, the norm. 
uh, and the question which I have for the panelists, can you share your views with regards to open dumping and open burning of waste in ASEAN countries and ways how we could prevent this going forward? What, for instance, are better and more sustainable ways of treating of municipal solid waste? Uh, Daniel, if I can turn to you first, uh, followed by Paul Sujay and possibly Raghu. That's to say, it is not a open dump, it's not an environmentally friendly way, it's also unsafe and not sustainable. But, you know, at the same time, it is often the only way that does not involve large upfront investments of money to manage waste. Hence, it is often looked upon as the, the cheap and affordable way for many developing and low GDP economies. It's always not by choice, I, I feel. Um, how do we prevent this? I think education is first, but I suspect many governing agencies uh, you know, are already aware of the new effects of uh, open dumps. Financing is also another solution, particularly with uh, PPP financing model. However, financing, PPP financing mod, for, for, for PPP financing model to work, a whole host of regulatory framework and policies and monitoring and enforcement practices first needs to be in place. Without them, the private sector will find it too risky to participate. It's not bankable. Now, putting together all these uh, legal and enforcement framework is not something that can happen overnight. Um, I think there must also be a proper and accurate way of accounting for the true cost of waste management in a PPP model because inadequate accounting puts the cost at too low, artificially too low, which leads to undercutting and uh, undercutting the quality and safety standards of uh, waste management. Now, this eventually, of course, will lead to secondary pollution and an erosion of uh, public trust and understanding. Okay, better ways, your last question, better ways of managing MSW. Um, now, assuming the policy frameworks are in place, um, the, the, the recognized methods, you know, from the most basic to advanced would be, you know, first of all, improved collection and coverage of waste, all right? Um, possibly, uh, if possible, encourage separation of waste at stream, at the source. Uh, at least the basic types of waste, like for example, the, the sludge and the MSW, you try not to mix it together. Um, you know, engineered landfill would be a natural progression from open dumps. Natural landfill with landfill gas capture and reuse, okay. Um, followed by composting, segregation, and if, you know, seg the segregation of waste, then composting, of course, you know, would be very helpful. Um, waste to energy is by far the primary way or becoming the primary way, okay, such as mass burn um, or other ways to energy techniques like uh, anaerobic digestion, right? Um, moving, that, moving forward then would be mechanical recovery of resources, uh, you know, MRF plants and mechanical recycling, things like that. And, and then last but not least, uh, I think what's, you know, what's emerging is the chemical recovery of uh, resources from waste. Now that, that is a lot more advanced, uh, but potentially offers you know, higher value in resource recovery. Thank you very much, Daniel. Um, can I turn to Paul uh, to provide uh, the sort of economic angle of, um, of open dumps and other ways to uh, address this uh, waste disposal issue? Thanks, Alad. So I think uh, when we look at open dumping, there's a series of um, factors that are the externalities associated with open dumping. And uh, I guess this is a perhaps a easier thing for an economy that can afford to pay for it to understand this. And if we're looking at some of the, the more uh, relatively less mature economies in Asia, and it's harder for that to, to really play a role in decision making, even though it's very real. But if we looked at open dumping, um, and Daniel sort of touched on all the, the various points around it, but uh, there's quite significant external um, environmental impacts. You'll have groundwater impacts potentially. There could be burning, um, sickness in communities, and, and all those sorts of areas, which are um, important considerations. In Hong Kong and also in um, Singapore, 
Uh, so moving beyond open dumping to some of the other um, ways of treating waste, a big factor they take into account is just the, the land availability itself. So if you start looking at land and the impacts in the surrounding area of the land, um, so you have communities that live around it, um, there's housing prices, demand, and land is, is constrained, it's a scarce resource, then that is really a strong um, mechanism for the government to look at other ways of doing things. And that's what you see, for example, in Singapore, uh, waste to energy, as, as Daniel's mentioned, is, is a very um, big uh, part of that strategy. And then similarly in Hong Kong as well. If you start looking at these over long term um, periods, uh, you can really start building a strong case uh, for an action to, to move away from open dumping. But as I said before, the realities of that for a less mature um, economy in ASEAN can be difficult for a, a government or a, to, to sort of comprehend that. So to move to some of the other areas about what um, the ways to tackle that, um, education and awareness building is a, is a big, big part of that. Um, it's a relatively lower cost strategy, which if done properly can have a quite a high return associated with it. Again, um, in some of the Asian countries, even just this part of the, the process could be done a lot better. Um, and even in Singapore, it could still be done a lot better. So, it's something that can always be um, improved upon. And then if you looked at some of the policies, so Daniel's already touched on, on some of these as well, but there's various policies sort of at a general level. Um, what do you do with landfills, um, national targets, and, and what the, um, you know, the, the, the country as a whole should be trying to do, looking at source and separation, uh, reduction in those sorts of areas, and then feeding that down into targeted policies um, about recycling um, and the technologies that can be used to help with some of that and so forth um, comes more important. And I think if um, the, the one part which is sort of gaining some traction, it's, very, it's quite large in the EU, is around the extended producer responsibility and trying to move things away uh, at the producer level rather than finally coming through the end where it is being landfilled. So back to you, Allard. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, very, uh, very useful for the audience. And uh, Sujay, could you uh, address um, the, the sort of emerging uh, technologies uh, from, from the financing angle in particular? You're on mute. Thanks a lot. Yeah. So just before that, just to add a bit of color around uh, the previous question that you asked, right? So I mean, just in terms of perspective, uh, we're generating about 8 million tons of solid waste a year in emerging markets, and 90% currently is into landfills. 50 to 70% of this waste in Asia is actually organic waste. So uh, one of the key things I think uh, we should be looking at um, from a more sustainable perspective is trying to figure out things like composting, uh, bio sort of um, uh, ways or more sustainable ways of composting that waste rather than just burning it in the first instance. Uh, the second thing I think from a sustainability perspective that uh, we should be looking at is also uh, uh, the amount people are ready to pay for waste management. So if you look at uh, ASEAN versus uh, the rest of the world, uh, Europe uh, uh, and uh, Central Asia, essentially people pay close to about 80 to $90 a year for waste management. In ASEAN, that number is half. And in markets like South Asia, the number is even lower. So uh, I think at the end of the day, uh, the public will have to play, pay a little more if they want to sustainably manage the waste. In terms of financing, I think uh, the key challenges uh, that we typically see are that not all the technologies are completely bankable uh, from a financing perspective. So what is uh, essentially tried and tested is things like landfill, things like waste to energy. But as you move to some of the newer technologies, like for instance, um, uh, plastic to energy, uh, you move to things like prolysis of uh, waste, um, and uh, frankly, even uh, the more basic stuff like biofuels, those are the ones where banks have typically struggled and uh, in fact have had losses in the past um, uh, as well. So uh, it, the key here would be to develop bankable structures in some of these type of sectors for financing to really flow through the sector. Thank you, uh, Sujay, uh, very helpful. And uh, Rugula, have you got anything to add? I just wanted to pick up on Suche's comment about bankable investment opportunities, right? And that's really where we as a, as a private investor with our fund want to come in to showcase that 
there are investment opportunities out there, whether we're talking mechanical recycling or chemical recycling, new innovation, which really uh, helps finding new distribution models. Um, redesign is key, that, the, that, that there is money to be made in the industry uh, with having an environmental and social impact. And I think that's really where we want to come in to then actually really en en enable the financial industry, the sector to then actually invest later on once they're considered bankable. I think um, that is what I wanted to add in general. The other points were mentioned. Um, it, it, it does start though with the consumer, right? And, and the corporations who actually produce the material. But when you look at the overall solid waste management and material recovery industry, I think what is key for me is that we start seeing the value in this material. We have not valorized it properly. It, it's, it's something we use once and we throw it away. But when you actually look at the different mechanical and pro, you know, technologies out there, when you build up the entire value chain from collection and sorting, which is mainly driven in, in, by the informal sector in South and Southeast Asia, to them properly processing the material to bring it back into, into um, packaging as, as with recyclable content, then there is really value in it and you can make money. Now, certainly the oil price and, and the historic low during COVID lockdowns doesn't help that because there, there, you know, then there is a, often we see that there's a shift back to virgin material. But when you look at it from a circular perspective, um, it is the only way to, to move and build the infrastructure to actually start, stop dumping. I mean, dumping ultimately is linear, it's out of our way. But I think what we also need to understand is that while we think and believe that even if the material is collected at source and it is somewhere dumped or on a landfill, it's still leaking. I mean, like the majority of the material recovered is still afterwards in some way or the other leaking into the ocean. So even if we put it into a landfill, it will leak. That's what, show, what statistics show. So we need to, to really build this, this supply chain uh, holistically. Yeah, very helpful. Thank you very much. Uh, let me turn to uh, recycling in Asia. Um, this um, uh, recycling activity is often in the hands of the informal sector. Um, the question arises obviously, how could we prevent this and increase recycling rates overall? Um, maybe Daniel, um, can I turn to you first? You're on mute. Okay, thanks a lot. Well, let's recognize this. Not everything along the whole value chain of uh, in, informal recycling is bad. Um, in fact, some parts of the informal recycling chain is highly efficient and done at a very uh, done at a way that is self-policing, um, driven by value. Example, collection of lead acid batteries, aluminum cans by the informal sector. And you don't want to encourage that, you want to enable that further. Where informal recycling is harmful is often at the treatment end, where much of the secondary pollution breaks, uh, takes place. This is where the problem needs to be fixed. Now, how to bring informal recycling to, towards a mainstream approach? Um, my take is that we got to recognize that stakeholders of the informal value chain are often unable to get themselves connected to the downstream part of the value chain. This leads to many layers of middlemen between the informal collectors and final users of the recycled products, which inevitably increases the cost of recycling as the waste resource progresses down the value chain to become a reusable material. Example of this is plastic recycling. Another example would be used cooking oil and also lead acid batteries. Now, one way to reduce the cost and inefficiency and to help stakeholders in the informal recyc uh, recycling chain to be back is to be, you know, to, to help them to be better connected to the off takers at the end of the value chain and also to help them to trace and account for the waste as it's processed from being a waste to a final resource. Today, uh, new technologies ex exist to develop these solutions, such as digital technologies like uh, blockchain uh, that facilitate you know, tracing of waste and open market platforms that re reduces the need for, for, uh, 
middleman. No? So, so these solutions do exist now. Uh, now we of course have to modify it and apply it into the informal recycling chain, and that's where the challenge lies. Uh. Informal stakeholders also need to have more access to technology and financing to encourage them to move out of the shadows you know, and towards mainstream practices that are more transparent, accountable, and sustainable. Very good. Thanks, Daniel. Uh, Regula, I mean, you, your firm invests and addresses the issues around uh, recycling. So we will be interested in, uh, in your views in this regard, too. Yeah. Um, you, you, the question was, how can we pre prevent informal, the informal sector to, to recycle or collect, right? And I think it's not about preventing that. It's about including them. I mean, in, in the statistics show that 60% of all the material recycled globally is collected by the informals. And in South and Southeast Asia, the majority of the material collected and brought back into the recycling industry is collected by informals. And it's their livelihood. So it's also a matter and on what Daniel said, how can we bring them to the table, include them and not exclude them? I mean, they depend on that, but how can we make it more just? How can we give them exactly access to transparency so that they get the real value for the material they're, 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 they're collecting, right? How can we enable them to have the, the proper uh, equipment to do so, um, to enable them to also be safe and healthy, right? So I think, and, and what I think we need to distinguish is between informal collection and then kind of informal recycling. I think the informal co the collection is key that the informals are included and that they're, they're, that they're given the opportunity to, to opt their standard of living by making a fair, a fair uh, um, wage, right? When we talk about the informal recycling, that is a challenge to the extent that that material often is downcycled, right? And therefore it's not really, it's not used, uh, used at its best. But when we look at mechanical recycling in general, um, you can today easily use a, a PET bottle and recycle it in a new PET bottle. And uh, the big multinationals, they, they expressed a clear interest that they're, they're, they want to do that and they already do it. So I think it's more about understanding systemically who are all the stakeholders. And it is extremely fragmented in Southeast Asia, not only by country, but actually by waste jet. We, we call waste shed in a way that we look at city, larger city areas to understand what, is re, what are the stakeholders who have to be involved to find systemic solution without negative externalities. And so I think it is key that, yes, the, the recycling industry have to, has to be upgraded to really value add, whereby the material is used at its best, brought back into circular economy to be recycled over and over again. And it's like that is key. And then innovation is key. I mean, it's beyond um, collection sorting and uh, recycling, innovation is absolutely key in making this industry work um, for traceability, for transparency, um, for, so that we really can link up each um, stakeholder in, in, in the entire industry. But it is a challenge. And as I mentioned early on, it's undersourced, it's not bankable. And I think that's why it is now really key that um, there is a commitment for, from the corporations globally that they take do the takeoff, right? They take the material at a fair price. That automatically then triggers the setup all the way downstream to make it work all the way to the source. And ultimately at the source, at the consumer level, it is about proper segregation. Um, at source, because the more contaminated the material is, and we see that in Southeast Asia, the, the less the value, right? The more the mechanical recycling or other technologies have to clean the material. So it is an in, in, in itself a huge complex topic, but I truly believe once we see the value in the material and we change our mindset in how we look at it, then we can, we can showcase and, and build on this evidence-based track record that it is an investable space, and it's not charity. Thank you, that's, uh, that's extremely helpful. In fact, it, it reminds me uh, to the days that I lived in, uh, uh, in India, uh, in New Delhi, and I was uh, responsible for uh, India's very first large-scale waste to energy uh, project in a public-private partnership with the New Delhi government. And, um, the protests were against the plant because people thought that we were going to make these poor rack pickers who were basically picking up 
uh, things out of open dumps and landfills uh, uh, be, um, be out of a job. And as a result, we actually built an, 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 a pre-sorting facility as part of the, the concept and employed ultimately 80 rack pickers with proper PPE material. And, and that basically stopped uh, the, the protest against these, um, uh, this facility. So very helpful. Um, back to uh, the entire panel. Uh, what are the main opportunities and biggest challenges to ensure that waste is converted to value in Asia? I mean, some of it was uh, already covered by uh, Rugula, but uh, from your personal perspective, uh, Sujay, can I turn to you first? Mute. Yeah, <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, so a few things I'd uh, mentioned. One is, um, I think uh, a change that I've really picked up in the last year or so, and which I also alluded to right at the beginning of my intro, is that the interest in this sector is very significant and it has changed compared to what it was earlier. It was perceived to be a very fringe niche sort of sector. And now we have a lot of these impact funds, which are fairly large. I mean, these are anywhere between one to five billion dollars. And these are all the brand names you could think of, names like TPG, KKR, Blackstones of the world, who are setting up impact funds, which are very hungrily looking for assets in this space. So I think to me, uh, the ability to tap that capital uh, is probably one of the number one things in terms of opportunities uh, that I would uh, definitely highlight within this space. I think in terms of uh, uh, other opportunities, I would say um, uh, there are uh, fairly interesting business models. For instance, uh, you asked a question about uh, things like uh, informal waste and how do we sort of um, uh, manage that problem. And one of the key things that uh, Regula also mentioned is that uh, this problem is primarily there at the hazardous waste side where you don't want the informal sector handling that waste. And a number of our clients have now come up who basically have a very differentiated business model, which is essentially working with uh, the large companies which have IT requirements, things like banks, Facebook, of the world, um, etc., who have large uh, uh, inventories of phones, laptops, which need to be recycled. And they have made a business model of procuring these on a systematic basis, disassembling them, recovering the value of the raw materials and selling those raw materials. Now, this business model didn't exist 10, 15 years back at that scale, which we are seeing today. So that would be, I guess, the second uh, type of opportunity I would uh, highlight from a banker's perspective. In terms of challenge, I think uh, those have been quite well explained. Uh, the number one sort of challenge I would mention again is sort of bankability uh, and the fact that uh, the off takers who are supposed to make these payments uh, in a number of cases are municipal governments who are not uh, too bankable. And that's where again, the role of DFIs can come in to uh, help mitigate the credit risk around some of these um, uh, type of structures. Thanks, Sujay. Um, and before I turn to Paul, I would like to encourage the audience to, uh, to list questions. There is a QA and a uh, button on your screen where you, uh, you're, um, you're able to, uh, to basically write your questions, which we will then uh, pick up at the appropriate time during the, the webinar. Paul, um, again, uh, main opportunities and challenges to ensure that waste is converted to value in Asia. I think um, just to add probably another perspective on it is the policy and regulatory framework which um, accompanies all of this. So uh, without having that in place, the incentive or the requirement for um, the sector to really develop and mature will be lacking. So if we looked at some of the, um, perhaps some of the less mature countries in ASEAN, they're at the lower stage of journey of that, their regulatory and policy uh, mechanisms, they might be in place, but they're a relatively um, less mature stage of, of development. Uh, enforcement is always a big question. And um, without enforcement, then, you know, it doesn't really matter what sort of regulations you have in place. And that's a, you know, that's a complex sort of question in its own right. And um, how do you do that and who pays for it and, and all those sorts of things. Uh, but having those factors in place definitely will help um, the industry as a whole adapt and look at new ways to respond to regulation as long as it's done in an appropriate manner, not um, sort of regulation for the sake of regulation. 
I think um, another is the role of um, governments as well to act holistically um, to help drive that regulation. So what you sort of see in Asia is very common and not just in waste, but in a whole range of different areas is um, there's a lot of different groups doing different things, different ministries doing different things. Um, there's overlaps between what's being done, uh, silos and, and all of that. So that sort of hinders this, this maturity and evolution of, um, of the, the industry as a whole. And I think, again, these are complex questions and um, not something that can be solved overnight, but there is very good examples of where that's been done pretty well um, in the region. And uh, you know, there's learnings there and sharings which could be, could be done. I think, um, with the rise in population and all this sort of, um, you know, just some of the, the, the amounts of waste and the concerns around, um, you know, just by a rising middle income group and people wanting to have something good for their children, um, you know, this intergenerational sort of considerations that the demand, uh, to just touch on what Sujay was saying, that, that's the whole reason why uh, the sector as a whole is growing so uh, considerably. And so there's roles in here for some of the others as well, I think, like the multilateral organisations to help. So we've touched on, uh, even in the previous questions, around um, the informal sector and um, empowering the informal sector. But, you know, a lot of these people, as everybody knows, um, are lower income, unskilled workers, highly vulnerable to things such as COVID. Um, how do you sort of give them the ability to um, be to adopt innovation or technology in what they do. And there's a funding requirement there, which needs to be filled and met by maybe other, other ways, such as some of the multilaterals, um, as an example. And the last thing I want to touch on as well was just what Sujay mentioned was about um, these other business models, which we're seeing in a whole range of different areas. It's not just waste, but, um, you know, as a service type model. So what we are seeing in terms of in the, um, in the EU, you have white goods as a service now. So rather than buying a piece of white goods, um, you, you rent it, you lease it for a period of time. It's taken back by the producer and it's disposed of appropriately. So there are these different sorts of ways of doing things, which are, are quite interesting. So back to you, Alad. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, I'm going to touch on waste to energy. Um, uh, Singapore stands as an exception uh, to other ASEAN countries as it has a sound and well-structured waste management system in place. Uh, Singapore opts for waste to energy as uh, the major waste management uh, disposal option. And this is partly due to its limited land resource, obviously. We've also seen a trend that island nations would opt for waste to energy first before other nations are accepting uh, waste to energy as an acceptable way to treat municipal solid waste and create value by generating clean renewable energy. Uh, examples here in the region are obviously uh, Japan, Taiwan, Macau. Uh, the exception is probably China, um, which is not an island nation, uh, but um, has uh, adopted waste to energy uh, to a large extent as the, the way to waste uh, management. Um, I'm going to turn to Daniel first. Why do you think this is and where and in which countries could capacity building and knowledge sharing uh, benefit to create opportunities for waste to energy and uh, the implementation of it? Okay, thanks a lot. Just a comment. Um, I think WTEs are not, you know, adoption of WTEs, uh, the observation that island nations adopt it faster. Um, yes, it may be a fact, but uh, I think, uh, um, you know, top in the minds of uh, planners, city planners, of whether or not to adopt WTs is always about, uh, one, one key factor is always about land space, you know. The alternative to uh, WTEs are landfills, and landfill occupy a huge space. And as a city grows, you know, uh, land becomes a premium, and urban city grows, and land becomes a premium. Uh, and that forces a lot of governments to then adopt uh, WTEs, whether it is landlocked or, or not, whether it's an island nation or, or, or not, you know, uh, this is a phenomenon that we see. Now, uh, barriers to adopt WTEs are often, first and foremost, due to the high cost of the WTEs relative to the alternative, which is, you know, landfills or even open dumps. Uh, um, other barriers would include, uh, would be, you know, the history of a, uh, secondary pollution or rather the fear of secondary pollution and as a his, the history of this that has happened in the past uh, 
and, and that fear that it could happen in my backyard. And hence, you know, you hear this uh, NIMBY effect, not in my backyard kind of uh, attitude towards WTE. Um, another barrier would be an incomplete understanding of the level of technology that exists today that makes WTE safe. All right. So WTE technology has progressed quite a bit now that uh, it is very safe uh, in terms of emission and, 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 and safety. However, the adoption of WTE uh, suffers from a few challenges today. Uh, first, fierce competition uh, brought about by new entrants into the WTE markets, uh, uh, more so like you know the Chinese uh, players, the Chinese suppliers of WTE equipment, who are not you know they are nothing wrong with that, but they are very competitive and they are able to produce the machineries uh, uh, at a much lower cost sort of thing. And, and this has drive down, you know, competition, drive down the cost of uh, implementing WTE, which is good. But it also leads to very uh, vicious kind of undercutting and, and competition. Um, and in a, in a framework where there's inadequate environmental standards and monitoring and enforcement standards, uh, in, especially like in many emerging markets, uh, uh, and developing economies, you see that gate fees uh, of WTEs go down to ridiculously low levels, okay, which you know only encourages undercutting standards in building and operating a WTE and hence risk the uh, secondary pollution, you know, uh, the emission of secondary pollution. Uh, another challenge that WTEs face today is the uh, decreasing renewable energy prices, okay brought about by the mass adoption of uh, wind and solar uh, energy, all right? These um, tariffs are reaching parity or have reached parity. And this has indirectly put the WTE sector under a lot of uh, financial pressure to perform because the electricity from waste tariffs are often packed to wind and solar tariffs. You know? So, you know, I think developers and financiers need to be careful about uh, which WTE opportunities to pursue. Uh, my general rule is that if the gate fee is too low, the tariff prices are too low for long-term concession, it is likely a risky deal to pursue. Uh, that said, I think WTE will continue to become the mainstay treatment for many nations, uh, but it will become more competitive as the technology and because the technology and solution is not unique and the competition is stiff uh, and as well as the renewable energy prices are, are, are decreasing. Um, so I think there will, um, in the long run, it's going to be tough for WTEs. It's going to be the mainstay, but it's uh, hardly, it's going to be more competitive. But, you know, um, I think there are also other opportunities besides WTEs. Uh, WTE is a generic uh, name. Um, you know, is instead of producing electricity, one may want to look at uh, producing other renewable sources uh, that may fetch a much higher value other than just electricity. Over to you. Thanks, thanks, Daniel. Um, Sujay, can I uh, ask you um, to address WTE? I mean, obviously, the bank which you represent has done uh, the financing for a 4,000 ton a day plant in Hanoi in Vietnam. Uh, Tell us a little bit about that uh, case study and, and how that was structured in terms of gate fees versus energy sales into the grid. Unmute yourself, please. Thanks, thanks, Alan. Uh, no, fa fairly good question. Um, and it's quite sort of uh, related to what uh, Daniel was just talking about in terms of the bankability challenge, right? Um, so just to give you a bit of context before we discuss this uh, specific deal is uh, in general, the experience that our bank has had on uh, especially waste to energy financing hasn't been the best. So waste management, I think we've had decent experience, but uh, something like waste to energy assets uh, in Asia in particular hasn't been the best. And uh, some of the challenges Daniel has outlined, but one key uh, thing I would add to what he was saying is also the consistency and the quality of waste. So a lot of the times what we have seen is basically you have technology which is coming from Western Europe or the US, which is being transported. In fact, even, even from Japan, which is being transported into other markets where the quality and the type of waste in terms of moisture content, etc., has been very different. 
and as a result of which basically uh, the plants haven't performed to uh, at least uh, the numbers that were shown to us initially. The second problem we've also had is in terms of procurement of waste itself. And uh, a lot of the times what's happened is the certain level of procurement which the municipalities were supposed to guarantee which would come into the waste plant. But very soon what we find out is the prices have either gone up or the quantity is just not available. So those are the two risks that uh, from a banking perspective we've typically struggled with in most of um, uh, Asia. In this particular one, uh, what we have done is uh, we've played a more uh, a role for a structuring uh, as well as coordination bank. And we've got um, uh, a covered lending done here. So for instance, in this particular deal, we have got Sinusure to come in and uh, uh, take bulk of the credit risk exposure. We have obviously taken some part of it, but bulk of the money essentially will come from Sinusure. And what SCB has done is essentially done the diligence around the asset um, and structured the debt properly to make sure that it's banking from a sign shop perspective. Great, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to take a question from the Q&A box and uh, this one is for uh, Regula. Um, Regula, it's about uh, the circular economy uh, and it's of growing interest in DFIs and multilateral banks. ASEAN has a lot of potential in this sector but what about tapping opportunities in the Pacific? Uh, so the Pacific Islands, an, an example has been given, uh, Fiji, uh, that are most impacted by oceans and marine uh, pollution. Yes, thank you, Allard. Well, I'm not an expert in the, in the situation of Fiji in general or the Pacific Islands, but I think it's you know, it, it, it's an issue which doesn't just happen in Southeast Asia. I mean, we have the same needs to intervene in the Latin region, in Africa, everywhere, right? For us, and maybe that's, I would like to address how I would like to address the, the, the question is, with this gap of capital, right, to really invest in sustainable value chains, um, we have $106 million available right now. Now, these five countries we're focusing on are really the ones who have the biggest leakage right now. And we need to turn off the faucet, right? We need to start where the leakage is happening first to build this necessary infrastructure. And the challenge we see is that we cannot do one-off investments. We cannot just go, oh, we have found a nice, interesting opportunity somewhere in Indonesia or, or, or another island to invest. We need to invest in the entire value chain so that these this recycling companies have sufficient feedstock, right? That the recycling company finds the right partners for the offtake. Um, and, and so when we look at the issue, um, is really holistically at city level, or we call it waste shed level, and build all the bits and pieces along the entire value chain, and that needs capital. So just by the sheer volume or amount of capital we have, we first need to focus on these countries where we see the biggest impact happening. But that doesn't mean that the other countries shouldn't be tackled or islands, and I think it's even more critical. And that's going back to my initial comment I made early on. Um, so we, we have to invest in companies to make them bankable, right? And I'm sure as we have created bankable investment opportunities in Southeast Asia, that trust me, we will move forward into other regions to tackle the issue because it has to have a systemic approach and you need to have sufficient capital to really build the infrastructure. But yes, there is a need everywhere. Southeast Asia is where the biggest leakage is and therefore for us it was clear that we start here. Great. I think there is a follow-up question also for you uh, in the Q&A box and uh, it's making reference to developed world countries where oil can be used for further refining to be used in virgin plastic factories to either go back to monomer state, should segregation of the feedstock was done uh, probably, or used at least to power polymer uh, factories in an environmentally friendly manner. Uh, this is, the, 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 uh, somebody in the audience uh, is claiming that this is the future uh, for hard to recycle pl plastics. Any any views on that? So I need to read the question again. It's a long one, but thank you, Max, for the question. Um,
Well, I mean, like, I think we need to distinguish between, uh, you know, the Western world and developed world and, and, and low income and mid income countries where, where um, the situation just looks different. I mean, like, uh, and we heard that before with waste to energy, you can't just use technology used in the European context, for example, in the Asian context. So I think we need to really find a local solution and a local approach in general, and whether that is chemical recycling or it's mechanical recycling. But what we certainly cannot do is believe that one, one solution fits all and one technology working in an, in an environment works in another. So I think that's why we're trying to approach it very open-mindedly, um, looking at all investment opportunities, um, mechanical, chemical recycling or advanced recycling technologies will lead into the future for sure as well, and then innovation. I mean, that's just very holistically. Um, and I think we need to keep an open mind to look at everything once it makes sense. But I think as far as the general chemical recycling goes or advanced recycling technologies, there's a huge, you know, there are many companies out there who are in pilot stage and, and they're, they're, they're certainly trying to make this work and make it also work economically. And we heard about the, the waste content and the calorific value. But in general, I think we just need to look into those and step by step uh, exploring whether they make sense or not in the local context. Great. Thank you very much. Um, let me turn to technology. Um, and uh, it's been touched on uh, by, uh, by a, a few speakers, but um, uh, I'll be uh, interested to hear your point of view in the selection and adoption of environmentally sound technologies that suit the local waste characteristic, characteristics and other social, cultural, economic and environmental concerns. Uh, where do you think are opportunities for the private sector to invest in, uh, in ASEAN um, and, and probably a point which was already tested on by Paul was a regulatory environment. So maybe I'll turn to Paul first and then uh, Daniel and Sujay. That's a good question, Elad. Um, I'm not a super expert when it comes to the technology, um, but at a more general level. So we've done some work here on the new, uh, we've done the feasibility study a new waste treatment facility that's being proposed in Singapore. Um, and one of the things that we did evaluate on that was the, the different types of technology that could be applied and the outcomes that are associated with that technology. So some of the considerations um, was the, the, the impact on the overall sizing of the facility. And um, it uh, again, it comes back to land and what did that mean for uh, for the project, but that also has implications for costs as well. So um, the affordability of this, I guess in the Singapore context, it's a little bit more easier to define that because in this case, it's a government led project. Um, so the affordability is something they're, they're looking more for value for money. Um, but what we did do in terms of the technology was there was a, I mean, the technical engineering consultants provide to us all the, um, the outcomes associated with that technology, uh, the wastewater that's, that would, be uh, let off by a different option, um, the air pollution, the impact of that to surrounding communities, um, and so forth. And then, as we've already touched on, the waste of energy that's associated with that. And then we would have we evaluated that from the um, a whole of life perspective, so roughly around a 25 year um, consideration, and then evaluated which one was was best. Interestingly enough, actually, the technology also had quite a strong relationship. So the preferred technology from more of a, um, an environmental, social, economic perspective had a very strong relationship to the preferred financial technology as well in this particular in instance, which was interesting. So some thoughts from me, Allard, on that Thank one. You. Thanks very much, Paul. Danielle? Unmute yourself. Okay, thanks, Allard. <laughs> okay, on this, topic of uh, environmental sound, environmentally sound technology and te technology selection. I think uh, one of the speakers uh, mentioned or, or touched on, you know, the need to uh, tweak the technology for local conditions. So the waste, you know, waste in, in Europe and waste in the US and waste in Singapore, or Asia, for that matter, they are all quite different. Uh, in terms of moisture content and composition and the technologies when they are designed, they are designed for a very narrow specification as to what is the feed type, quality and things like that. So, you know, adoption of technology has to take, 
into consideration the adaption, adaptation of the technology or modification of technology to suit the local condition. And that's easier said than done. It requires quite a, uh, quite a bit of a deep dive uh, into, into the technology to, to know how to modify it and, and to tweak it. Uh. And uh, interaction with equipment suppliers, um, it's, it's a challenge, especially if, uh, uh, if one doesn't know uh, his stuff, you know, you, you kind of get hoodwinked by, uh, by equipment suppliers. Uh, another challenge on uh, uh, adoption of uh, environmental sound technology is the recognition that, uh, you know, technology, um, the, 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 the selected technology has also, must also be compatible in the upstream uh, upstream manner of which waste is collected and received, you know. So um, in the West, you have a lot of uh, uh, segregation policies and, and practices in segregation of waste and, and separate collection of waste and so on and so forth. So the waste stream, by the time it arrives to the operator, it's purely it's it's fairly uh, uh, well conditioned sorted out and and therefore it's easier to to manage uh, uh, not so much for not so not 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 the case for asian ways uh, and and you know weather plays a, a a big factor too and and because of weather and uh, uh, lively and, and uh, different ways of living uh, you know different types of food uh, dietary uh, uh, differences uh, waste tend to be a lot more wet and a lot, you know, in bags and, and unopened uh, for, for sanitary reasons. Uh, uh, and, and so, you know, one has to consider that this is the waste that is being received and, and, and then whether the technology is able to adapt it uh, and, and whether there's a need to, how much, what is the extent of pretreatment, okay? Um, so this is, this, is, this is the technical challenge. Um, I would say that there are also other challenges, non-technical challenges. Um, for example, you know, um, forming the value chain to support this adoption of technology is often a uh, an area that is not widely mentioned. Uh, but uh, but trying to get stakeholders and along the entire value chain to work together uh, to form a commercial proposition that is bankable. This is, in my view, you know, as a practitioner, this. This is so far uh, more difficult than, than assessing technology and, adopt, uh, and modifying technologies, you know. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Daniel. Uh, Regula, um, although in, in, the, in a different area of the value chain, but definitely technology plays a role in what you do. No, technology plays a key role when we look at recycling, right? And I think what we have to do is, is to distinguish between the different plastics, right? Plastic is not plastic. Plastic is PT, it's PP, it's, it's uh, HDP. So I think what, what we need to demystify is for, particularly for PET, the mechanical technologies out there, I mean, the, the, the washing of the material and the sanitation of the material is available and, and can be and is applied even in the Southeast Asian context. Uh, even if the material is probably and is more contaminated than it may be in a European or a Western context where it is segregated at source. But it's not, for me, it's not so much about the technology. I mean, that has been proven and it's done these days. I mean, like, look at all the big multinationals in, in which use recycled PET, as I mentioned, bottle to bottle or, or for, for packaging a uh, food grade. I mean, like there is the me mechanical technologies out there to produce food grade recycled content. Mm -hmm. So that is not the issue, I think. It can be done and it also can be done in the, in the uh, Asian context and it is done and that's what we're investing in. The, um, what is key though, as, as, as Daniel also said, is that again, we go back to the source and uh, for us, that's why we also need to invest very heavily in, in the collection and sorting, meaning investment in MRFs, municipal um, recycling facilities, right? Which get immediately to that material, segregate it properly to then have it recycled. What I think is key is really the corporations as well. I mean, they have made commitments. Our investors are champions in, in committing to the offtake of the material. They've committed to recyclable content. And so as all the stakeholders start lining up, these projects become not only environmentally and socially impactful, but also financially interesting and eventually bankable. 
So I think it's both, but the technology is not the issue. I mean, there is SSD technology out there which can clean the material and I wouldn't have any problem. And at least this is by the highest standards, either it's by F, uh, FSA, by the European standards or by the US uh, F, uh, FDA standards to, to be compliant with the save it is needed for food grade applications. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, Sujay, I mean, particularly on your uh, deal in Korea, where there was a portfolio of various different types of waste to energy facilities and waste management uh, facilities. Um, uh, your view, please, on uh, the technology aspects uh, to uh, create sustainable waste management. Yep. So I've got my mute button off now, Alad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I think uh, it, it's a good uh, uh, again, sort of a uh, point to bring out in terms of uh, how investors view different types of uh, waste technologies. So uh, on landfill, I guess uh, there was a clear reluctance from a number of um, investors because there was a perceived negative connotation uh, with landfill. Whereas uh, I guess waste to energy had the most uh, investor interest purely because it is the most proven of all the technologies within uh, in Asian context. Uh, to your other question in terms of where the private sector can channelize more capital, I would say things like hazardous waste uh, is very interesting. Uh, we are seeing increasing amount of uh, uh, interest here because the fact is that uh, some of these contracts are customized and can help get around the issues we typically see around things like municipal waste. So uh, to give you an uh, example, for instance, uh, currently we are working with our, one of our clients in Asia who is looking to divest a business which does marine oil waste management. And there again, we see a wide variety of investors uh, interested there because um, uh, the business model is very differentiated and it's not dependent on subsidies per se from the government. Similarly, we are working with the oil and gas company, which is trying to divest its um, uh, hazardous waste business in the Middle East. Uh, and there again, the contracting structure is such that the offtake is dependent on the highly rated oil and gas company instead of the government. And there again, um, uh, the investor interest is quite strong. So hopefully that gives you a flavor of uh, what are the type of subsectors within which um, the private interest is there. Great, thank you very much. I mean, you touched on hazardous waste and there is actually a question uh, around COVID-19. Um, and uh, the, the question of one of the uh, attendees is, given the rise in hazardous medical waste from COVID, have you encountered uh, business models and or bankable structures in this subsector of waste? Maybe I can stay with you first, Sujay, before I turn to others. Yeah. So, uh, frankly, we haven't seen a lot on the medical waste side. And uh, the problem uh, there is probably some of these companies are not uh, big enough. So a lot of that uh, is done by smaller names, which uh, typically from a bank perspective might be difficult uh, to finance. But when you get to larger scale projects, things, as I mentioned, like oil waste management, which um, uh, requires hundreds of millions of um, dollars of investment, that's where you will come across more bankable sort of structures from uh, at least a private investor's point of view. Okay, thank you. Um, Daniel, are, are you guys in hazardous yeah. waste treatment as well? Yeah, we, we are, we are. And uh, I, I echo Sujay's uh, comment. I think the medical ways, um, you know, even in spite of COVID, right, the volumes, uh, compared to the total hazardous waste market is still small and uh, and there is sufficient capacity to uh, to, to handle this uh, COVID waste. Uh. And given also that the very likelihood that the industry, the hazardous waste from industry has probably re uh, reduced significantly due to the lockdowns, right? So there is a lot of spare capacity available to take in uh, medical waste. Uh. Mm -hmm. um, but I think industrial medical, industrial hazardous waste is a very uh, lucrative sector. It's a very high-end sector in the whole hierarchy of waste management. It probably sits at the top because it's uh, uh, technically more demanding. The technical barrier of entry is a lot higher. Uh, it's also uh, much more highly regulated compared to other types of waste management markets. Um, and it's also very private sector driven, uh, meaning the clients are usually the uh, private sectors as opposed to the government uh, agencies, right? Um, uh, 
Um, so the oil and gas, the petrochemical sector is definitely, you know, the, the thick of the, the, the best industry, uh, you know, in terms of uh, generating the, in terms of pricing point of view, you know, it, it always commands the, the premium there. Um, but that's it, it's not easy to enter into this market. Um, mm-hmm. and, and it's also quite difficult to forecast whether there's going to be a glut because, you know, as with uh, private sector, right, it tends to swing up and down with uh, the, 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 the global economy. Uh, and and uh, you might find that, uh, you know, in a situation like COVID, that there will be uh, less to, there'll be a lot of competition for the waste you know, because uh, prices would go down, treatment prices would go down due to excess of capacity and, and, and uh, uh, reduction in the supply of hazardous waste. Uh. Uh, but that said, there are very special ways um, that, that commands a premium and, and a long-term, uh, long-term profitability. Right. A follow-up question on that. I mean, you basically say, look here, it's a lucrative market, but it is difficult to enter. What, what sort of market entry barriers uh, do, have you experienced or do mm. you see? Mm. So I think technique, okay, first of all, the technique of uh, hazardous-based management is not just chuck it in and, and incinerate, right? There, there is a whole lot of chemistry to it. You, know, you, you, you don't want to be mixing uh, waste that is too flammable, too, too flammable and you cause you know, fire hazards. Uh, there's also safety, level of safety. The level of safety for managing hazardous waste is way much higher than uh, managing municipal waste. Huh? And, and the rates of the frequency, the, the likelihood of accidents happening uh, with uh, hazardous waste is a lot la- uh, higher and therefore, you know, regulatory standards uh, when it comes to safety and emissions are a lot higher. So, so, so you know, the cost to enter into that market, you operators need to be well, how do I say, well versed in, in the management of hazardous waste to enter into the market. Right. Uh, must have the knowledge, the technology to do so, and also the best practices in terms of safety and you know the rigors of uh, moving ways and, and keeping track of ways. Uh. And all this adds to cost, uh, 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 but you know it's well compensated for the price of the uh, treatment of uh, of uh, per ton of hazardous waste. Right. Thank you very much. Before I turn back to Paul and cover some of the governance issues around that, uh, Regula, uh, not just in relation to hazardous waste and medical waste, but more generally, what has been the impact of COVID-19 in in your business model? Well, the impact in our business model uh, was just that um, we have to move even faster to support the existing uh, supply, uh, existing businesses and make sure that they're uh, weathering the storm. But we have conducted a, a study, an in-depth in, in study with uh, GA Circular and interviewed many uh, stakeholders out there in these five markets we're operating in. And, and honestly, most of these companies in the solid waste management industry, whether we start with collection sorting to, to uh, recycling, they're in dire straits. I mean, like it hit them hardest. Um, but we have to maybe step back. Oil price dumped to the lowest, you know, historically low. Um, the, 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 uh, when you look at the, the need for recycled plastic, it's in construction, stopped. It's in electronic goods, that stopped to some extent, right? It was, it's in, in the automotive industry, got to a stop. Where there was still a continuous demand on the material, recycled content was in, in packaging because of the, uh, in, in the fast moving consumer good com- uh, sector. Um, so suddenly the, the wor- waste workers couldn't go to work. Um, the overall industry was not considered essential. Therefore, exactly, it came to a halt. The demand, the offtake came to, was significantly decreasing. And then we also had the old price. Now, what does that mean for an, for an entrepreneur? Uh, cash crunch. Um, they had to shut, stop, most of them had to shut down their factories um, and just see how long they can su- sustain with the possible, um, you know, resources they had. But it really shaken the existing industry um, in Southeast Asia. And therefore, what we said is now even more than ever, we need to help them support and, and get through this time to then build because we cannot afford to step back. Thank so you. the impact has been is significant. 
Uh, on top of that, more material was consumed, right? The, the, the single-use plastic consumption in Thailand increased in April by 15% because people moved to ordering in and wanted to have it safe. So really, we, it, it was quite disruptive. However, I think with an increasing oil price, with seeing the end eventually, with the needs of, 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 of our, our support and many others out there who support, um, they, we will help weather the storm and then we have to continue doing business. Um, because also the socioeconomic impact um, is detrimental. We know how many people fell back into poverty um, and, and that is often not seen because they are the most vulnerable, right? Yeah. Clearly, uh, and thank, thanks for sharing that with us. Uh, P Paul, uh, on the governance side, uh, most ASEAN countries uh, appear to have already well-established national strategies to uh, address these challenges related to uh, waste management more broadly. Uh, may, some of them through an environmental act, uh, and environmental acts, others through green growth and sustainable development and climate change policies. Um, how and which countries in Asia could benefit from waste management policies in more in a holistic level and national level uh, in order to prevent those barriers between the various different regulatory bodies and, and ministries? Yeah, so the governance is a, is a big, um, it's a very big topic. And uh, if you went across ASEAN, and it wouldn't just be in waste, if you went across virtually any telecommunications, financial services, uh, transport mobility, customs and immigration, all of them, they're all, um, the diversity that exists uh, in terms of governance across the region is enormous. You also look at the, um, the economies which are doing relatively better in ASEAN, their governance is generally stronger and that would probably hold uh, globally as well. So, um, the, the governance perspective is, is really, really important. ASEAN has a, um, a series of um, initiatives. So they, they, there is initiatives around solid waste and waste management. Um, they're structured. There is various regulations at a national level which exist. Uh, but the, it's really around the capacity and the capability of those governments to um, to implement those policies, to enforce those policies. And that's where it really, you can really, if you get beneath the surface, you see um, large differences across the region. Some of the things that are happening in ASEAN, which is um, there's a lot of movement in ASEAN for a more regional approach and um, a more coordinated, harmonized ASEAN across all areas, including in waste management. And uh, the, I think there's certain learnings that can be some of the economy. So that's happening when you look at, for example, uh, Vietnam is doing some interesting areas. They've got some, um, some, some good regulations. Singapore is always seen as the gold standard. Uh, you have Malaysia to some extent, Thailand's doing some interesting areas and so forth. And there's these bilateral types of um, initiatives ongoing between different uh, member states to transfer that knowledge and help build capacity, capabilities and so forth. And I think, Actually, we were touching on some of these areas before around the informal sector um, and recycling as one example. And governance plays a big role in that as well. So if there's vested interests, which does exist, there was a question actually before about Fiji. We work a lot in Fiji. Mm. Uh, I know the market very well down there, but they, they suffer the same sorts of challenges around vested interests from stakeholders. And it requires quite strong political will to try to break some of those cycles. And it's not an easy, um, uh, situation to overcome and, and not something can be solved overnight. So I, I guess quickly to summarize it up, governance is diverse across the region. Um, it's, uh, it's important. So without it, it uh, I think that things are always going to be constrained or less than optimal. And in terms of learning points, um, some of the more advanced or more mature Paul can be the places to, to share. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Paul. Uh, there are two more questions which I would like to uh, quickly uh, uh, address from the Q&A box. Um, one is for Daniel, uh, and it's about chemical recycling um, uh, and, and the reality around it. And one is about financing, uh, Sujay, uh, which is at uh, the, the bottom uh, of 
the um, Q and A box. Um, so, Daniel, first, uh, first over to you in terms of chemical recycling. So, um, Max is the uh, Max has put up a question. Um, can cycling is it really applicable in Southeast Asia, or mechanical recycling should be prioritized? My take is that uh, both mechanical and cam cycling are solutions and, and they have to be solutions to plastic recycling, right? Um, so it's not one or the other, but it's both. Uh, and if you look at it, mechanical recycling is more meant for the PET material, uh, whereas cam cycling, it's, uh, technology is tweaked towards the PP, addressing the PP and the PE materials, all right? So, so uh, and... Can mechanical recycling, there's also a limit, you know, as to how much you, you recycle. It's cheaper, but it's, there's a limit to how much recycling you can, uh, how much number of times you can recycle the material because, before it becomes uh, too degraded to be reused, all right? And whereas cam cycling, uh, the, the, the benefits is that you, you can continuously, one can continuously renew, uh, reuse the material you know, by, by paralyzing it into a synthetic crude and then, you know, uh, making a renewable plastics out of it again. Uh, um, but the challenges in adopting that technique in Southeast Asia, it's not going to be something so straightforward. Uh, uh, predominantly because the, the type of waste, the plastics that come into, uh, well, first of all, collection of the plastic is a huge challenge in, in Asia, right? It's, it's, decentralized, it's highly decentralized, it's informal, and trying to get to the source of the plastic, it's, uh, you know, it's going to be, it's probably going to be uh, uh, very difficult and, and a huge cost. Uh, um, secondly, I think the plastic that arrives is also in a condition that may not be ideal, so that there's a lot of pretreatment that's needed uh, to make this work. Uh, last but not least, is really on the commercial model of uh, camp cycling, all right? The off takers are they willing to pay for it, right? Uh, and how are they willing to pay for it? For you know, every business to be bankable, one uh, it needs to have a some some kind of long term visibility in terms of long term contracting model, right? And the issue with uh, plastic recycling and synthetic crude, right, is that oil prices pack to oil prices and oil prices going up and down. See, so as a as a operator of a camp cycling facility, you want a kind of a stable pricing regime with your off taker, maybe the oil and gas guys or, or mm -hmm. the FMGC guys. But the question is, are they willing to do so? All right, uh, and to what extent the devil lies in the, the details line. The, the devil is in the de details uh, and all these uh, commercial terms. Uh, um, so, so it's it's not that straightforward. Uh, it's more than just a technology. It's also about commercial, uh, putting it put together an entire you know value chain of it. Extended producer responsibility would uh, help a bit uh, to lower the cost uh, and the cost barriers uh, to to do camp cycling, uh, but it's definitely not going to solve the answer. See some the off-takers would have to take a position to, to provide some kind of long-term off-taking guarantees so that the upstream value chain can perform this recycling operation uh, uh, commercially viable. Thanks, thanks, Daniel. In the interest of time, um, and I'm going to make a suggestion to Bridgem, uh, the Energy and uh, Utilities Committee. I mean, we could do an, uh, a separate session uh, sometime next year on the four and the five R's, addressing basically reduce, reprocess, reuse, recycle, and uh, and recover, and then linking that in with the circular economy. So uh, let's park this for now. Um, thank you very much, uh, panelists, for uh, your sharing your insights with uh, with the attendees today. And um, I'm going to hand back to uh, to Tim. Thank you very much, Allard, and uh, thank you to the panelists and your companies and your teams. I know a lot of effort goes on uh, to get you uh, to join these panels, particularly your external relations team. So I'd like to thank you. Of course, again, to the Energy and Utilities Committee for uh, putting on this event. Um, it's taken a lot of planning to cover the topics. We have covered a lot of ground, and I hope that those of you who've joined us I've got a lot of insight, whether it's on policy, regulation, around pricing, tariffs, financing, the technical side as well. So um, an awful lot of ground. And thanks, Allard, for your suggestion about next year. 
We have got some more events coming up uh, in, uh, in 2020. We're not finished yet. Um, we're going to do an event on carbon capture, utilization and storage, which uh, is not published yet, but mark your diaries for December the 2nd. But a big event we'd like to tell you about is at the Singapore International Energy Week, where Britcham has got a think tank round table, which you can register free of charge on the Singapore International, uh, Singapore International uh, Energy Week website. And uh, you can uh, join that session on uh, October the 29th. That happens to be the same day as the awards and uh, look forward to all of the companies who have entered those and uh, see, seeing the shortlist which has been published and of course for winners. You'll see the other events uh, which are up there. So lots happening in Britcham. And of course you can access the replays to this event and all of our other events which are available on the Britcham site and YouTube channel. And we've covered an awful lot of ground this year from decarbonisation following the Chamber's Road to Net Zero campaign around transportation, shipping. Uh, we've looked at financing in a COVID world. We've looked at hydrogen, circular economy, and this event really adds to, uh, to that theme. So thank you for those who joined us and thanks once again to the panellists and committee. And with that, uh, I'll sign off and say thank you once again, everybody.